So we're chatting with Alan White, who's the Vice President who works in partnerships with Biblica, the International Bible Society. Welcome along, Alan. Tell us a bit of uh, what your role is uh, with the International Bible Society. Hi. So uh, I uh, work with the International Bible Society. Um, we're over 200 years old. Um, we have um, the rights to the NIV. It was our organization translated that, brought it into being in the late 70s. And so come forward to today and uh, basically there's 7 billion people on the planet. 4 billion people have never even seen the scriptures or heard about Jesus. So my role at Biblica is not that we take the Bible to those 4 billion, but we ask the question, what organizations and groups are working with those 4 billion? And my job is where they need Bibles to try and help make that happen and get Bibles to people. We then hand them out to people who don't know Jesus. Mm, wonderful. And I, uh, I love your accent. Tell us a bit about uh, where you were born and raised. <laughs> well, I'm just from a little city just northeast of here, um, <laughs> northeast of Brisbane called Belfast in Ireland. Um, born and raised there. Um, and then about 17 years ago, uh, God called us as a family to come and live and work in the United States. I worked for a seminary in Philadelphia for a number of years and then took up my role with uh, Publica about four years ago. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Now, as a preacher, I often will quote from the NIV. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll, I'll do the Amplified if I want to be really loud, you know, or, yes. or, or, I'll, uh, I'll u- <laughs> or I'll use the message if I want to yeah. keep it really simple, you know. I'll use different translations. Occasionally, you get people saying, oh, the NIV, it's corrupted and they've taken things out, they've changed things. But I think it's a great translation. Well, what's, what's your response when, you know, let, let's go to one of the, the top dogs, you know, what's your response when people say, oh, the NIV's got something wrong with it? <laughs> well, simply our response is this, is the best translation is the one you're reading. Mm. We are not interested in saying we've got the best translation or whatever. But, you know, from time to time, I, you know, people come to me and they say, you know, you've left out words or you've changed this or whatever. All I can tell you, we have real experts that work on this. And um, everything sort of depends on the context. Mm. You know, so these are people that understand the context that the scriptures were written. Mm-hmm. You know, the scriptures came to us in ancient Hebrew, mm-hmm. Aramaic, Greek. Um, we're told that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Mo- they came to us in Hebrew. Moses didn't even speak Hebrew. Mm-hmm. So, so there are debates that we're not really interested in. But here's what I can tell you. You know, um, a lot of people um, like the King James. We all learn verses from the King James. I learn verses from the King James. Great translation. But when the writers of the King James were doing their translation, they were working off 10 manuscripts. Mm. The oldest of those manuscripts was about 1000 AD. Today, because we continually look at our translation and update the NIV as needs, as more things come to be known, Today, our experts are working off 5,800 texts, Mm. and the oldest of those is 200 AD. Mm. Mm. So they're dealing with a lot more information on which to make their decisions. Mm. But at the end of the day, as it was with the King James guys and every other translation, it's a judgment call for experts. Mm. But the main thing is we don't say that we have got the best translation. Mm. Read the one you like. Mm discover Jesus and grow to be more like him. That's the main thing. That's wonderful. And I, uh, as a preacher, I love looking at many different versions and sometimes you get more out of a different version than, than another, you know, and it just helps you, you know, make it a bit clearer in your mind when you look at the different translations. And uh, uh, out of curiosity, and, you know, you might know the exact stats, but I'm assuming the NIV is the most popular translation around the world. Is that right? Or? Yes, Um most Bibles ever sold or distributed as the King James, mm-hmm. but they had a bit of a head start. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So, so today, by a factor of, I think it's at least four, mm-hmm. the NIV is the most sold, distributed, compared to the next mm-hmm. one. Um, we have a great partnership with YouVersion. Mm-hmm. We have the Bible app for your phone. Last year, there were, f- well, 2018, there were 5.7 billion 
chapter downloads of the NIV alone yeah. on you version. So, yeah. we're, you know, I'm people on the radio can't see me, but I'm of a certain age. So I remember an old singer called Larry Norman. Yeah. He sang, why should the devil have all the good music? My line is, why should the devil have all the good technology? Yeah. And so a lot of what we do around the world in partnerships is not physical Bibles anymore, but using apps, using technology, using even video. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have partners like an organization called Lumo Mm -hmm. who have made movie quality video of the four Gospels. And they use our text Mm. for that. Mm. So... God is using technology in some very interesting ways to get his word yeah, out yeah. to people. Wonderful. Now, I've been mentored by Pastor Wayne Cadero from New Hope Church in Hawaii, mm-hmm. and he's very big on life journaling, mm-hmm. teaching people to read through the scriptures and doing the SOAP, the mm-hmm. Scripture Observation, Application and Prayer. You read through the Bible every year, twice through the New Testament, once through the Old Testament. So I do that every day. I love reading through the Scriptures every day. I've got got it on my website at my church, and we just go through it. Um, And so we're always challenging people in our church to read the Word every day, to feed themselves on God's Word, Mm -hmm. because a lot of people rely on other people's feeding, (laughs) but we've got to feed ourselves, you know. Um, I'm curious for you, after many years, you know, in in ministry and what you do, what's your personal devotions that you do? Well, again, um, I uh, I am one who just you know works my way through the scripture. Yep. Um, I believe very much that this is the word of God, mm. and God's spirit leads us and inspires it mm. as we encounter the scripture. And um, I believe firmly that all of scripture is all about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And so, the more time that I spend in His Word, the more that hopefully mm. I grow to be like Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my daily devotions with him. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. And uh, working in Christian radio, I'm a big fan of a couple of Irish Christian bands that have released some great music recently, and you sound very much like them, I've got to say. Uh, The Wren Collective and another band called We Are Messengers have both released some great worship music and Christian music recently. Have you heard of those guys? Are you related to them? Do you, you know, did you go to church for them? You know, is there any connection, brother? Well, <laughs> um, again, for those who can't see me, I'm a bit too old for the Rain Collective and things like that. But, and if my old friend ever hears this, I'm going to give an old friend a plug. A dear old friend of mine is the hymn writer Keith Getty, oh, yeah. who wrote In Christ Alone and many other great hymns. So even though Keith's a bit younger than me, um, that's probably a bit more my era yeah, yeah, <laughs> than, yeah. than things like the Ren Collective. But I'm familiar with these. Yeah. Um, my kids tell me yeah, about yeah, yeah. them is, <laughs> is the honest answer. I'm a sad old Presbyterian folk, so uh, <laughs> the old metrical psalms are about as racy as it gets for me. So it is. <laughs> And what about uh, Bono and, and you too? Have you ever connected with those guys over the years? You know? uh, haven't connected. Um, again, to get into stories, um, I first, as a 21-year-old, saw you two play in Belfast in 1981 at a small venue, Queen's University. A friend of mine was in another band, and you two were one of the opening bands. Mm-hmm. And that first night, I thought they were terrible. <laughs> And what I often say to friends is it's cost me a fortune ever since to go and see them in concert. And <laughs> So I've seen them many times. My sons are big fans, and, mm. and I'm a great admirer of Bono for his, his Christian work that he does. I mean, he reflects Jesus around the world, and um, I'm, I'm a great admirer mm. of him. Getting back to the Word of God, I do love their version of Psalm 40 oh, yes. uh, that they've sung. That, and that they've had a, I mean, they're not known as a Christian band. They're known of a band of Christians. I don't, know if, I don't think they're all Christians, but, mm-hmm. and they might not, we might not all agree on everything they yeah, believe, but, uh-huh. but they, you know, they seek the Lord and, don't and, and you believe either. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> um, but uh, isn't it amazing? And I wonder how many people have heard their songs and have searched for God or searched for the scriptures because they sow a lot of seeds in their lyrics, don't they? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, not very, uh, as a Presbyterian, not very Calvinistic or (laughs) very Reformed, but uh, their song Grace, you know, I would say nearly needs to be added to the canon of scripture. Mm. For me, it's like Psalm 151, you know, I mean, it just Mm. beautifully Mm. interprets what grace is all about. Yeah. Wonderful. And you've been travelling around Australia. Uh, What are your thoughts of uh, the spiritual climate of our nation from what you've seen? 
Yeah, it, it, this is my second time in Australia, and I've been struck very much. Um, there's almost like an aggressive type of secularism mm -hmm. in, in this country. And in some ways, that's disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, but in other ways, you know, I, I travel around the world, and I go to places like China, and I see the church under real pressure mm -hmm. from the authorities. And... Um, I'm very struck that that's one of the places where the church has grown most. Mm. So sometimes it gets darkest mm. before, you know, God really yeah. gets things moving. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I read the scriptures. I look at the New Testament church. I look at, you know, Paul's little letter to that church in Rome, you know, who faced persecution, death, rape, everything, mm. um, some 2,000 years ago he wrote to them. Mm. I mean, it did not look good. There were maybe only 100 believers. Roll forward 2,000 years. There's billions of believers around the world. And uh, Jesus is known throughout the world. Mm. And dear old Caesar, well, we now name our dogs after Caesar. So <laughs> there is nothing that God cannot do. So, mm. you know, I just would encourage people in the church to love their neighbor. Mm. Um, where I come from, we talk about not going to war with culture, but working to redeem culture. Mm. So pray for our neighbors, pray for those in power over us, and um, pray that the Holy Spirit will bring revival to Australia, because mm. that's the answer. Mm. And you've been travelling around with Pastor Peter Kassivaru, uh, who is the founder of the Mongaza Children's Choir and uh, planted many churches in Africa. Uh, tell us about how you guys connected and, and how you've been impacted by his ministry. Yeah, well, um, I was in Uganda about six years ago um, with work, with my role and encountered Pastor Peter. Uh, we struck up a friendship. Um, I came home and said to my wife, I have just encountered this guy who started this most amazing ministry mm. in uh, Uganda. They basically, you know, I said to Cheryl, they're bringing kingdom values mm. as well as spreading the gospel. And Cheryl and I became supporters. Peter came and visited. We became firm friends. And what they have achieved in 30 years is quite remarkable. You know, 7,000 children are sponsored a day. We could always have more people sponsor more kids. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, they've planted over 700 churches. They have hospitals, medical centers, universities, schools, orphanages. And um, about a year ago, that's where they are after 30 years. They've planted about 700 churches. Wow. And um, so Peter and I were chatting, and he asked me to come and help and develop a strategy plan for them. So we've developed a strategy plan that looks towards 2050. Mm -hmm. The population in Uganda is going to rapidly grow in the next 30 years. It's going to quadruple. There'll be about 130 million people live in Uganda in, a, in an area that's about the size of New South Wales. Kampala will be a city of about 30 million people. So we ask the questions, what does it look like, not just for the organization, but for the church mm -hmm. looking forward? Let's try as Christians as, to get ahead of the game mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than playing catch-up as usual. So I help them with develop a strategy plan. Uh, some of the key aspects of that is, for instance, we hope to plant 5,000 churches in total. So we hope to have about up to 2 million people in our orbit. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a big fan of the book, The Tipping Point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get to 2 to 3% mm -hmm. of any population, and that can be a real tipping point for moving forward. So that's what we're trying to achieve with Africa Renewal Ministries. And I play a little small-time part role in this, um, but I'm honoured to do so. Mm. Well, I first heard about Pastor Peter when the Mwangaza Children's Choir came and sang on the radio and, and visited our church, and I was just, wow, so blown away by And they had such a passion for Jesus. They were so well-mannered. I said to my kids, you need to learn from these kids, you know. But, but um, you know, what a great ministry uh, the choir is as well, and I know they've been a blessing to the nations. And uh, let's keep praying for revival in Uganda and 
um, looking forward to uh, hearing the fruit of uh, the the future of this ministry in the future. So, well, Alan, it's been wonderful to hear from you, uh, the Vice President and working in partnerships with Biblica, the International Bible Society, working with NIV. Uh, the website is biblica.com if people want to find out more information. Uh, Alan, it's been wonderful to meet up with you today. I reckon you're a history maker. Thanks for joining us. It's been good to be in Oz. Thank you.